How's everyone doing? Good? Glad to be here. Glad to be here for another week. If I haven't met you yet, my name is Pedro, and uh, I'm the lead pastor here at City Life. Glad to be here. This is my first week back to preaching in, I had two weeks off, so I'm glad. Hopefully, knocked all the rust out over the week as I practiced and prayed. Uh, but it's good to be back. Miss you guys. Uh, let's do this. Today is our last sermon in our sermon series about speaking Jesus. And to end, I just want to uh, give the picture, the vision of what we sought out to do. We started week one looking at John chapter four. And up until this week, it was the only week that we weren't in the book of Acts. And we started in John chapter four in one of the gospel accounts because the gospels, the four gospels, are a witness, a testimony of Jesus' life. And we start with Jesus' life because we wanted, I wanted to look at an example of a clear instance where Jesus told someone who he was and the whole picture of who he was. Right? In John chapter 4, he met a Samaritan woman uh, in Samaria. And he met her at a well at the hottest time of the day. And this woman, the, one of the most unlikeliest of characters that Jesus would ever interact with, uh, spoke to him and gave him her criteria of what the Messiah would be like, what he would do when he came. And in John chapter 4, verse 25, she said, I know that Messiah is coming, he, he, is, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And she lays out what she knows that the Messiah will have to do, one of the tests, one of the criteria of what this Messiah is going to be able to do. He'll know everything. And then Jesus proceeds to tell her that he, doesn't, he not only knows everything about everything, he knows everything about her, specifically her. Right? Not the universe, not biology, not chemistry, not about politics of the time. He knew all of that. He made all that. He formed all of that. But he told her specifically everything about her, her deepest sin, her biggest shames. And he proved to her that not only did he know everything about everything, he knew her. He knew her intimately. He knew things that she did and things that she was about that no one else would. And in this moment, he then tells her one of the clearest examples in all of the gospel accounts of who he is. He says, I who speak to you am he. Right? Super surprising and shocking that he told her, right? A woman, a woman of reputation, a woman uh, who was a Samaritan, right? With a Jew. Everything about this was shocking. Why her? Why did she get one of the clearest examples of Jesus, at least recorded in what we have, of who he clearly was, uh, without a teaching that went along with it, without a parable to, disc to make sure that those who don't care don't hear, right? He specifically just told her who he was. And from this, she heard the truth, and ran to her people who had rejected her. And it doesn't say how many people came to faith, but through this shameful woman sharing to her people, a multitude of people came to faith in Jesus, right? Through her speaking Jesus, even her, even this woman who was rejected by the other women in the city, even her testimony brought people to faith in Jesus because speaking about Jesus is what we were made to do. And so we started in John, and then we went to the book of Acts. The book of Acts is this testimony, it's this uh, record given of how the church began, right? Because before this, there was no church. We live in the age of the church, but the church like we have it today existed after Jesus' life when the Holy Spirit came at, in Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost. Right? And from that moment, we looked throughout the book of Acts, not every encounter, but we looked at specific events where the followers of Jesus told other people who Jesus was. 
We looked at all of these different events and different circumstances to different people. Some of them were apostles. Some of them, Stephen was a deacon, and other people were just normal followers of Jesus. But they were these people who loved Jesus, were so in, like captured by who Jesus was that every single one of them put their lives in jeopardy to tell people of who Jesus was. And so we see this account of the church growing like crazy in the first century because it was all of these people who were convinced that Jesus was a man, but more than just a regular man, the Lord of everyone. And the gospel message spread like crazy in the Roman world because, simply because people spoke about him. Right? Jesus' followers were so passionate about him that they just spoke about him every time they went along. And we started, oh, sorry, I forgot about this. We started in John chapter 1 because we needed to establish that our only message is Jesus. Our only message in everything that we live for and everything that we say is Jesus, the person of Jesus and who he is. Our, our founder, A.B. Simpson, wrote a hymn. I'm told he wrote a lot of hymns, and most of them are very bad, but this one is really beautiful. And in it, he says, Jesus only is our message. Jesus, all our themes shall be. Jesus, uh, we will lift up Jesus ever. Jesus only will we see. It's like our, our only message is Jesus. And then when the church received the Spirit, when the apostles received the Spirit, like we said in that week, like never before, received them, he indwelled and lived with them for all time, the church grew like crazy. And over the course of this sermon series, we uh, were looking at a few questions throughout all of these. Who heard the message? Who was it for? Who received it? And who rejected it? Who did Jesus' followers go to to speak to? Uh, when was it okay for them to say something? How did the Spirit move in the exact moment that they needed to say someone? What happened when some of their lives were on, stake, on the line and sometimes they, were, they escaped their death and sometimes they didn't? But we looked at all of these scenarios to see what does it look like for someone who believes in Jesus to speak about him? to use all of their life to speak to him. Sometimes they had a mission, like Peter, who went to Cornelius. Uh, he got a vision, and he was told to go, but sometimes they just stumbled upon an opportunity, and they took it. All of these different circumstances, but they spoke about Jesus, the one who they loved more than anything else, more than their own life. And so to close the sermon series today, I, I want to close with a little bit of symmetry. We started with the gospel account in John, right? John is not the first book of the New Testament, but is a part of the gospels where the New Testament begins. It's where Jesus' life ministry begins. And then today we're going to look at the book of Revelation to see what Jesus says about when he will come again and who he has left here to continue to speak to him uh, about him. And so, if you could join me by standing for the reading of God's Word, we're going to be in Revelation. This is really easy to find if you, are in, if you have a physical Bible, because it's the last page of the Bible, Revelation chapter 22. And this is the Word of the Lord. It says this, starting in verse 12, Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay everyone for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs and sorcerers, the sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves the practice and practice falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come, and let the one who hears say, come, and let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires to take the water of life without price. I warn everyone who hears the word of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share of the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. 
He who testifies to these things say, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Amen. Let me pray for us. Lord, I thank you for this day. And I thank you for keeping every single one of us and for bringing us here. I pray, pray that every word that I say uh, falls in line with your scripture, with the story you've been told, telling and giving us. Lord, I pray that you would be with us and illuminate your word for us so that we can be people who speak Jesus to the world uh, because that's just what we love to do. It's what we made to do, and it's what the bride is left here to do. And so, Lord, I thank you. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, feel free to take a seat. All right, so today I feel really called to do something simple, but you know me, I complicate simple words. Whenever I say I think today's going to be shorter, it's usually a little bit longer, so I'm trying to avoid doing that. But for the first part of our sermon today is just to look at the revelation to John. Uh, before we talk about what is in the book of Revelation, we've never looked at it here at our church, so I just want to at least briefly describe what this book is all about. We did that with the book of Acts, and I want to do that here really quickly. And I, I want to say that out of the 12 apostles, 11 of them were murdered in their lives. Out of the 12 apostles, right, there's always today, nowadays, we're so removed from the first century that we would be tempted to think that the apostles started this world movement to benefit from, to gain riches from, because that's what a lot of pastors do today. That's what a lot of churches do. They are just conning people to get more money and accumulate more wealth. But out of the 12 apostles, 11 of them were brutally murdered for their faith in Jesus. There was nothing to gain from believing that Jesus was our resurrected Lord. For any of these men, they were all persecuted throughout their life, and 11 out of the 12 of them, as church tradition holds, were murdered for their faith in Jesus because they wouldn't reject believing that their rabbi was also their God, right? And so 11 out of the 12 apostles were murdered. Only one made it to old life, and he wasn't even free by the end of his life, uh, the person who wrote the book of Revelation was the Apostle John, and he wrote it in about 95 and 96 AD. This is some 60 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, 60, about 60 years of the church growing and the gospel message spreading and it going to new cities and it continuing to uh, be lived out by people who hear and then come to believe. The age of the apostles with, with John is coming to an end, but the church is still growing. The gospel message is still spreading because it's not just a movement that these 12 men and about 120 people at Pentecost uh, believed in or made up. There's more to it than that. And he is the last apostle living, and he is in a prison on the island of Patmos. I included a map of it so we could see uh, where it was. It's where the uh, red circle is. To the left is Greece, and to the right is Turkey, and it's one island just in the middle there in the Aegean Sea. Uh, you can visit it today if you would like to. There's, I'm sure there's some way that they're getting tourist money from people out there, so you can definitely go there. And so he's stuck in prison in here, and all of a sudden he gets this vision. John, the Apostle John gets this vision, and in Revelation chapter 1, verse 11, he says this. He all of a sudden hears a voice coming from behind him that sounds like a trumpet, and he writes this. He hears this. The voice says, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Theatria and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. And so the instruction that he is given is that he is about to get this vision and everything that he saw he was to write down and spread it to the churches. And in this book, if you have ever read it, and I assume many of us have not, you will find crazy, awesome, the real definition of the word awesome, like awe-inspiring things in this book, in this revelation. 
You'll read about dragons and creatures. You'll read about 200 million men armies, of which we know where they will be fighting in Israel today. It's in this field that actually does fit 200 million men. You hear about uh, throne rooms and angels and archangels, uh, fantastic sounding creatures. You also hear about this wedding festival, wedding ceremony between a lamb who is worthy, humble and worthy to open the seal with his bride, the church, Jesus and his church. You hear about a beast coming out of the sea. You hear about letters specifically to churches. You hear about the new heaven and the new earth that will come down here to earth where God will live with those who belong to him. And and there you'll read about roads of gold. There having been no more seas, no more sun, because Jesus is the one that lights everything and there's enough. And all of these wonderful things you'll see in the book of uh, Revelation. I almost said apocalypse because that's what it is in Portuguese. Um... And he records all of this. And though there's way too much in the book of Revelation for us to deal with today, I am not prepared to lead us through a study of Revelation at the moment. Uh, I want to do this with it. I want to look at the very end of Jesus' last words in all of the Bible to see what he says, his last words to the, his people that are included in the collection of these New Testament writings that are inspired by the Holy Spirit and given to the church until he comes back for us to know what it would be, what it will be like when he returns. And so I want to do one thing first and then another thing. I want to look at Jesus's last words and then I want to look at Jesus in the book of Revelation to remind us that he is worthy of giving all of our lives to talk about who he is to people. So first, let's look at Jesus' last words, what we read today. It starts off in chapter 22, uh, the last chapter of Revelation of the Bible. Start, we started in verse 12, and he starts talking here. These are Jesus' words to John in his vision. He says, Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense, or, which means my reward, with me to re- repay each uh, one for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. So here in Jesus' last words, in the last chapter of the Bible, he begins to talk to John. He says, I'm, I'm coming soon. All right? Our definition of soon is wildly different than Jesus' definition of the word soon. But it makes sense with a God who exists outside of time that it would maybe take longer than we would want it to. But Jesus is saying, I'm, I'm coming back soon. Read chapters 24 and 25 of the book of Matthew if you want more scripture about what it will be like when Jesus returns. But he's here he starts saying, I'm coming soon. At some point, I am coming back. Right? One of the fourfold gospel pillars of the CMA, our denomination, is that he is our coming king. He will come back. It matters how we live our lives. It matters how people live their lives because he is coming back. The king of kings is coming back, and one day every person will meet him. Every person who has ever lived will see Jesus face to face. I wonder how much we've heard that over the years, or if you're a new believer, or if you are exploring Christianity for the first time, hear me say to everyone, no matter where you are in spiritual journey, we will see Jesus face to face one day. He's coming back. What we do with our days matters. It really matters. Jesus will come back and he will judge the world, everyone according to how he perfectly and righteously knows everyone needs to be paid back. And then he tells us who he is. Again, three times in the book of Revelation, Jesus is referred to the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, uh, the first and the last. He is the one ahead of everything, ahead of everyone, every power, everything, every person, every name, all power, all might belongs to him. He's the first. He's the best. He made all of this, and all of this was made for him, and he's coming back one day. 
And then he says, well, he doesn't say this. The angel continues this in verse 17. And this is where I want us to leave off in our sermon series. This is like if we can remember one thing about what we're supposed to do in our lives, if you could grasp onto this last thing, it's verse 17 of Revelation 22. After we've looked at Jesus talking about who he is himself, and then after we've looked at the apostles and the early church, the earlier believers, the people who were first filled with the Spirit to talk about him, after we look at those two, let's look at Revelation 22 and hold this with all of our hearts. It says this in verse 17, The Spirit and the bride say, Come. Right? The church, the bride of Jesus, has been left here on this earth, and what we are called to do is to live our lives faithfully to Jesus, his teachings and his commandments, with his body, with the church, as we say to everyone we ever can, come, join us, follow Jesus. He's the answer. He's what you've been waiting for. He's who you were made by and for. Come, join him, hear his story, hear what he did for you, hear that this is not just a nice story, but a true the truest thing that has ever existed, come, right? And the bride doesn't do this alone. It does it with the Spirit. Whenever you talk about Jesus, we've covered this in the series, whenever you talk about Jesus, you're not saying that in your own power. There is no good part of you, there's no amount of eloquence that you, that I, that anyone might have that will convince people that Jesus is the way. It's the Spirit's work in your words and in their lives. We are people who just say, come, come. Let me tell you about Jesus and why I believe in him, why I have come to believe that he is the Lord of everyone. Come. That is what we've been left here to do to be people who just invite people to hear more about Jesus. Your jobs are great, and you need them. Your relationships are awesome, and I, if I pray God-given, right, all the influence that you have uh, has been given to you for you to live your life, for you to do a good job, for you to be an upright citizen, but it's all of it is for you to speak about Jesus to the world. And if you're not using it to tell people about Jesus, I wonder how far below our calling we're living. How dead or numb we might feel in our faith because we take no risks to tell people about who he is, and then it becomes dead inside of us. Right? Speaking Jesus is what we were left here to do with the Spirit, because it goes on and it says, the Spirit and the bride say, come. And then it continues, and let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. Right? It's also up to the hearer of the word to be thirsty and to desire more. Because there are many people who are in this life who do not want to pursue truth. There are many people who do not want to live more than what they are just doing or living for themselves. But we don't know that. And we are people who are supposed to just say, come, listen to Jesus. Let me tell you about him. And if you desire and if you are thirsty, if you know you need more in this life, if you know that there is more, if you have that God-shaped hole that every single one of us do in our souls, let me tell you about Jesus because he's the only one who fills it. We're people who say, come. We're people who in invite others to receive their share of the water of life. Remember all the way back to John chapter 4 when Jesus is talking to the Samaritan woman and he offers her living water. That's what we are supposed to be about. People who invite people to receive the living water that they are thirsty for. And many don't know how. And the, so that's really the message. That's like the lasting message about what we are left here and why we're supposed to be speaking Jesus. But I want to do one other thing that comes up for us in the book of Revelation. I want to remind us of who we share why we share about Jesus, because I think uh, many of us are very comfortable. Well, I think some of us are pretty comfortable with the gospel descriptions of who Jesus is and the Old Testament prophecies. I think for many of us that makes sense to hear about this humble lamb, this humble baby who was born. 
Isaiah 53 is right, and it tells us that we will all be saved by this suffering servant. I think we're pretty comfortable with at least receiving that, that we would be saved by a God who would humble himself, be beaten and destroyed for our sake to save us through his own stripes. Right? I think that is romantic enough for the world to come to believe, or for many to come to believe in him. Or Isaiah 7, where it talks about how we would be saved through the birth of this little virgin, a, bo- a baby born from a virgin, right? That sounds really lovely. That's really romantic. Like, I think that is pretty attractive to a lot of us. Or in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, when it talks about a child being born and that he would bring peace and his name would be Wonderful Counselor, Everlasting Father and Prince of Peace, right? That sounds really nice. That's attractive to a lot of people. Uh, And I'm not here to discredit any of this because that is all the picture of all of who Jesus is. But Revelation also gives us a different picture of Jesus. Right? When I tell us that we are supposed to, well, not me, Scripture tells us when we are supposed to be living our lives, telling people about Jesus, uh, this is also who we are supposed to be talking about. Revelation gives us some wild descriptions of what Jesus will be like when he returns. Right? Not just the Lamb, though that is in Revelation. He is the Lamb who is worthy to open the seal, but he is also all of these things. Listen to how his appearance is described in the book of Revelation. It talks about his clothing. It says that in chapter 1, verse 13 and 16, it says that he will come dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet with a golden sash around his chest. Not too crazy, right? That sounds nice. That sounds like something that a king of kings might be wearing. But then in chapter 19, verse 13, he's also wearing a robe that's dipped in blood. Wild, right? What about his hair? In chapter 1, again, it talks about how his hair that was on his head was like wool, as white as snow. Or how about his uh, head? That in 1912, it says that there are, he is uh, this person who's coming, and he will have on his head many diadems, which are jeweled, covered crowns, right? The king. Or how about his eyes? which twice in chapter 1 and in chapter 19 say that they're like blazing fire, right? When we see him in his return, his eyes will blaze like fire, something that we can't even imagine. Or how about his feet? His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, right? These descriptions of Jesus are wild. They're out of this world in the real sense of that and not just the corny expression that old people say right? His voice was like the sound of a rushing waters. And in his right hand, he's holding seven stars. And in his mouth is a sword. In chapter one, it says that it's a sword coming out of his mouth uh, that was sharp, double-edged sword. And in chapter 19, we hear about that sword again. And it says that the sword uh, is to cut, strike down the nations, right? This is wild. This is unexpected. This is not also just a humble land. This is something that is bigger, something that is mightier, something that is out of this world and bigger than we can understand, more powerful than righteous. Or how about his face? It says that his face was like the sun shining in all of its brilliance in chapter 1. Revelation also gives us a picture of Jesus' true nature. It three times, like I already said, it calls him the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. It calls him the worthy lamb, it says, and between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns, with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out to all of earth. That's wild. That's not just a normal carpenter from Israel. He was that, but he is also at all times so much more. He's also the rider on the white horse. It says this, Then I saw heaven open up, and behold, a white horse, and one sitting on it called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself, Revelation 19. Right? Jesus is this man who lived in Israel, but he is 
so much more than that. He's so b much bigger. He's, we're given some of his names of what he's called in Revelation. In chapter 3, he's called Holy One and True One. In chapter 19, he's called Faith and True. Uh, he's the Word of God. He is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He's the root and descendant of David and the bright morning star. I want us to focus on these things because so far in our series, we've been painting a picture, a true picture, that sharing Jesus is organic to the believer. It's normal. It's natural. It should be the most natural thing about us because we've been saying all along, people speak about what they love. And we don't need to have board meetings to talk about what we love. We don't need to have full classes to be able to talk to anyone about things that are so natural to us. And over the course of this series, we've been saying, look, guys, it's, it's normal. For these followers of Jesus, they got to know Jesus' story. And then when the circumstance came up, it just flowed out of them because the Spirit empowered them to do it. It is natural. It is human. It is organic. It's what we were made to do. And I just want to add to that, that we are people who go about our days sharing because he is the lamb, he is also the lion of Judah, he is mighty, and every soul that has ever lived will go face to face with him one day. And he is all of these things that should, to a point, scare us because he's much bigger than us. He is all of these wonderful things. He's so mighty and he's so powerful and he is just so much greater than we could ever imagine. We should not dumb this man down. We should not say that he is only casual or that he is only friend, though he is our friend. He is our first love, but he is also the king of kings. And so he is worthy of you giving every ounce of your life to talk about him. He is worthy of every embarrassment that we might ever face to tell someone about who he is. He is worthy of being rejected even by the closest people in our lives if we truthfully tell people who he is in love because he's worthy of all of it. Because one day, this is not a threat, this is true. We will stand before him and he will talk to us about how we lived our lives and how bold we might or might not have been for him. To tell everyone, even everyone in here, because I don't know where your hearts actually are, that Jesus is the one you've been made for, by and for, and that all of your trust should be placed on him above anything else in life, especially yourself, especially your heart. Oh, the worship team can come up, because I'm pretty much done. But I want to add today to our sermon series that speaking Jesus is organic, it's natural, it's lived in, it comes easy to those who know the story and who are full of love and the Spirit's power because we talk about someone who is also beyond all of this, much bigger than all of this, who we've all been made to meet one day and to live, all of us, to live eternity with. And so let's worship this Jesus and I'll come back and I'll lead us to...